Let's first greet the entire kingdom of God. I greet you all in the mighty name of Yeshua, our Lord, our Savior, our King, who died on the cross for us, so that we may be free, so that we may have a life full of accomplishments despite the terrors in which the enemy does his best to bestow upon the people of the Most High. And hence, we have, if like a calling on our lives, all of us, to ensure that we operate in the will of the Most High outside the will of our own, of ourselves. Because in doing so, there is victory, despite the struggles. In doing so, there is prosperity in ways that the world do not understand. But as believers, we do understand. And so it's a mystery. Today's message is, I'm hoping to be the last part of Must Have Unity, hence why I mentioned to Mummy that um, no scripture reading, let me crack on with the word today. It is part three, hopefully the final one. I'm going to do a quick recap in regards to part one and part two. In part one, we recognize that the heart is the portal of the conscience. And it's important that we do not, do not harden ourselves. Because by doing so, we are limiting the effectiveness of the Spirit of the Most High. We also learned that in 1 Corinthians 1, there was discontent amongst the members of Corinth. They were arguing amongst each other in regards to who is the most effective preacher and it created division amongst themselves. We also learned in regards to the, the disciples themselves, they themselves had issues. We looked at Mark 10, Luke 9, Luke 22, and we saw a common thread. The common thread was self-interest, the need to be the number one, the need to have things their way or one man's way and be, and be the conqueror and the leader, be the one right beside Christ and no one else. And they created issues. Even on the day where the Most High, Yeshua, was sitting down having the final supper. They were still arguing. Recap, part two. John 17. Through John 17, we saw through John 17 the heart desire of Christ. What he wanted for his people, knowing that his people are going to go through stuff. Not just externally, but internally. Within the kingdom. His precious kingdom. John 17, we also learned that in Acts 15, Galatians 2 and Philippians 4, that the issues were not just male on male, but also female and female that was creating, unknowing to some, division, unknowing to some, chaos. But now, I want to go into Revelation. Let's see what the Most High has to say to his people. Revelation. It's Revelation 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to shew unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy 
and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand for John to the seven churches which are in Asia grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne I'm going to skip forward unto 11, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, unto Smyrna, unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned, this is John, and I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, the Most High Himself. And he had in his right hand seven stars and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword hallelujah let's have a brief look at the locality of these churches so there's a picture this gives you an image of the locality of the churches all the images brought to you here i just want to give credit to resources on the internet that are free for us to use free great resources free bible images org and free svg org they allowed me to use these for free all right they're available to anyone to use and what we see there is we've got the island of patmos john was an exile in the island of patmos at this time when the most high appeared to him we may be able to see there the various trade routes and it is thought that the seven churches and the different scholars have different thoughts as to why did the most high speak only about those specific churches when, when when there must have been more so some say that these churches are representative of the nature of his kingdom the total kingdom they are examples of and he's speaking to, to all of them in regards to the fact that, look, we need to shape up. In another way, some say, that those churches are an historical view of the times. And hence, particularly events occurred for a certain time period and so on and so forth. I'm of, if I'm being honest with you, the former view. It is for all of us, whatever the time. Because... Most High said, prophecy for the end times. Okay. So, before I continue, I want to just go into one thing very, very quickly. That angels has a meaning. There are perceived two different meanings for the angels. Some say they are actual angels themselves, but equally, the other meaning to angels is one who brings the message, the messenger. And often, that is often attributed solely to those who bring the word. The messengers, like the bishops, the pastors. But I believe that depending upon the context of the word, all of those meanings apply it's to understand the context in which it's written to recognize is this about a person bringing a message or is this about an actual angel bringing the message you decide for yourselves as we go through the scriptures equally the meaning of the churches because it's mentioned there about the seven golden candlesticks and the seven stars. I want you to bear this in mind as I go through the scriptures. The seven stars represent the angels. Okay? 
the candlesticks, the golden candlesticks. It's important to understand the color. Golden is like a precious metal. Right? The kingdom of the Most High is precious to Yeshua. His kingdom, his people. And the candlesticks represent all the churches. As you go through Revelation 1, it explains it in more detail. So as we read now going forward, we now have a frame of reference going forward with this. So Revelation 2. Let's start with this one now. Unto the angel or messenger of the church of Ephesus, write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not. And has found them to be what? Liars. Strong words. He's not mixing no words this time. He's not being no parable this or parable that. He's saying strong words as it is. For his people. Number three. And has borne and has patience. And for the name's sake has labored and has not fainted. I mean he is commending his people. Well done. Nevertheless, number four. He said, nevertheless. Let me say it again. The Most High said, nevertheless. I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent. So even though we are saved, even though we walk in, a, in, in, in the power of the Most High, we are still meant to repent when we do things that are wrong in the kingdom of Christ. I wonder how many of us actually do it. We talk about freedoms and the powers and the authorities and there's hardly any repentance. Within the kingdom, he's speaking to his people. And do the first works, or else, or else, I will come unto thee quickly, and will what remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. The Nicolaitans, at that time, it was believed that it was created, a group created by a guy named Nicholas. Nicholas was formerly part of the faith. And he wasn't happy with things. And he got involved in other things and created his own ideas. And they became a major force, a major difficulty for the Christians who were there because what? He was formerly of the faith. And he created havoc amongst the kingdom people. And here he's saying he hates the Nicolaitans, those who follow him. Number seven. He that hath the, an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh, will, will I give to eat of the tree of life. This is the blessing. If you overcome your own shortfallings, this is like the major blessing. I believe that we are all saved. Right? I believe there will be rewards. But here, Christ is saying, if we behave ourselves properly in that particular group, the rewards will be even more magnificent than the rewards you would actually get. I give to eat of the tree of life. 
which is in the midst of the paradise of God. In the midst of the paradise of God. In my, or maybe our, imagination, I can't even imagine what that's like. But I know it's going to be glorious. Uh, the reason why I know is because for those of us who are saved, in one moment in our time, or several times, we've had an encounter with Jesus. And it was glorious. That will be beyond measure glorious. So in summary, I have a little tiny chart. Ephesus, you might not be able to read that, but it's okay. Ephesus, the meaning of Ephesus is desirable. Desirable. The name given to that church, Ephesus. And in the chart, it gives you a breakdown, a summary of the commendation, the rebuke, and the exhortation of Christ and what he wants you to do to correct it. And then it gives an alternative. See, if we don't correct it, these things will come to pass. But then he has a promise. By correcting it, this is the promise. So you will see there, for each one I go through, there will be a summary for you to have. Next verse. Revelation 2 verse 8. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna, write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. That must be strange to some people of the world. Christ has acknowledged that these people are working hard for the kingdom, sacrificial. They're going through some serious tribulations. Tribulation, that word it means things are very, very serious. People are dying. And it recognizes their actual poverty. And the world don't understand this. And yet the Mosai says, but thou art rich. It's a contradiction in terms on a carnal level. But on a spiritual level, it makes complete sense. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of what? Satan himself. So Christ then says, fear none of these things which thou shalt suffer. Fear none of these things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, and ye may be tried. And ye shall have tribulation ten days, or even more. Be thou faithful unto what? Death. Death. And then he says this, and I will give thee a crown of life. Now it makes sense, but thou art rich. Now it makes sense. By going through such suffering that the eternal goal is what really matters. Not this earthly goal that matters. The eternal goal. His people are going to suffer. We are going to suffer one way or another. And he says it again, 11. He that hath an ear, let him hear, hear. What the Spirit saith unto the churches, he that overcometh shall not be heard of the second death. Again, it makes sense why they are rich. And once again, the summary. And what they like about this particular church, Smyrna, the meaning of Smyrna is sweet fragrance of myrrh. Beautiful. He commends him on the tribulations, but he has no rebuke for them. There is nothing in there that he rebukes them for. What it tells me, that that is an area of church that is truly operating in unity, in one accord in the will of the Most High, and not individualistic in its, in its, in its, in its way. They make room because what? they had no time for it. 
because they were under so much tribulation, they had no time for it. The one thing they understood as one is that they believed in Yeshua who died on the cross. And they believed and understood what will come for them. So they made that. So no matter what they were going through, they still stayed true to the course. Hallelujah. So Christ had nothing to rebuke them for. Can we say the same? Can we honestly sit here and say that what I have done in my lifetime, since, whether, whether it's before or whether it's since I was a believer or can believe in Christ, have I truly behaved myself? I'm going to tell you no. I know there are times when it happens. Is it good enough? No. Is Christ all forgiving? Yes. But I understand if I stay the true course, the reward, meaning the Bema judgment, you might remember in one of my previous messages, I mentioned about the Bema judgment, the rewards for the people of Christ, for the people of God. And it's a reward where, they, where, you, where your life will be reflected to the Most High and be put back to you. And the judgment will be based on what, you, what your reward is, based on the things that we have done since believing in the Most High. We are all saved. Let me get it right. Let me say it again. We are all saved. But there is a form of a judgment based on rewards. And what I believe Most High is saying here in Revelation 2, these are the ultimate rewards. But we may get less than that. If we don't shape up. Revelation 12. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos, write, These things saith he, which hath a sharp sword with two edges. No joke. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain amongst you, where Satan dwelleth. That is important. Where Satan dwelleth. Because Antipas the way that he, he was slain must have been, I mean, terrible to the imagination. I don't know whether you've watched some horror movies in your life. Yes, I have. And sometimes you see some torturous movies where they talk about, you know what, you know, some of these gangsters and, and you see some things and you read some books of people's real life. Real life. And I think, what? Did that really happen? And some of the things that they do to human beings to get information is absolutely terrible. You think, how can someone survive something like that? And I believe it's that type of torture is what Antipas went through. And yet those who were around, who were meant to deny their faith, kept their faith. Hallelujah. 14. But I have, once again, the but, but I have a few things against thee, even these people. Oh my gosh. Even these people. Because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. So in amongst the people, there are those who are idolatrous. Who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. To eat things sacrificed unto idols. And to commit what? Fornication. And so hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. So they've also don't like those other people. And yet... 
They've been fornicating. And yet, they've been giving sacrifices to the idols and following the doctrine of Balaam and so forth. And he says, repent. And here comes the alternative. Or else, I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. So those who are amongst that congregation will be severed. How, in what way, how they will be saved? I'm sure they'll be saved. But what reward would they get? Why use the term, why use the term, the sword? What does a sword do? And it cuts deep. It even severs. That's why you use the term sever. This is Christ speaking to his kingdom people. 17. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saying, He that receiveth. Amen. Again, the summary. We have it all. The meaning of Pergamos, believe it, is height or elevation. And it also has another meaning. United in marriage. United in marriage. Pergamos. He commends them for the things that they are doing. But he also rebukes them. And he exhorts them and says, please repent my people, repent. And once again, how many of us actually repent in these modern times once we become saved? More often than not, the repent that we do is the moment when we are saved. We are saved and we repent of all our sins. We take baptism by water, Holy Spirit even. But what happens after that? These people here do exactly the same thing. And yet Christ is saying as a prophecy, repent. And there's a promise. There's no point trying to play smart with the most high. There's no point. Sorry. <clears throat> Revelation 2. 18. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira, write, These things saith the Son of God, who has eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, let me say it again. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. 21. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication. I gave her space, the chance, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed and then not commit adultery with her unto into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. Once again, What's the word? 
repent. And here's the next verse. And I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he which searches the reins and what? The hearts. And I will give unto every one of you according to what? Your works. The reins and the hearts. If you recall I mentioned earlier on about a shared conscience. That the heart is the portal of the conscience. We cannot afford to harden that heart. We need to learn to be more amenable to each other. Because by hardening your heart, we are in danger in going down the type of paths as we see right here in Revelation. If it continues. Because in the end, Because your heart is so hardened, there's no more time for it to heal. It becomes a scar. But yet we know that through the Most High, we can be healed. Which means to me, if you repent, truly repent from the bottom of the souls of our spirit, etc., then that same scar will be healed. Because you truly mean it from the depths of your spirit. And it continues. But unto you I say, unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan, as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden. But that which ye have already hold fast till I come. Is that interesting? The burden that you hold fast to? That you decide to hold fast to. And he that what? Overcometh. And keepeth my works unto the end. To him will I give power over what? The nations themselves. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers. Even as I received my father. I mean, what a blessing. Providing one overcomes. 28. And I will give him the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And once again, here's a little summary of the chart. To summarize that. I wonder what's the meaning of Thyatira this time. It means sacrifice. Sacrifice. I know it's hard to see, but it's all in there. It means sacrifice. We see the various commendations, the rebukes, the exhortations, the alternative if you do not shape up. And yet we can all agree, and we say it all the time. We preach it, we talk about it, even the world speaks about it. That we are living in the last days. And yet our behaviors don't seem to recognize that. Our behaviors don't seem to truly acknowledge that. Now, we find it so hard to be at peace. Churches fight against churches. Individuals fight against each other within the kingdom. That, it it doesn't make sense. And yet, that is our reality. In the kingdom of God, it's the reality. And we see it right here through the words of the Most High. Now we go to Revelation 3. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis, Right, these things saith he that has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. 
be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore, thou hast received and heard and hold fast and what? Repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch and will come on thee as a thief, I will come on thee as a thief. And thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. So even amongst those in Sardis, there are those who are walking true, and they must be going through some tribulations, because others around them aren't. But they are walking true. And Christ sees it, Christ acknowledges it, and Christ intends to reward it. Number five. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. So even those he recognized who are going through these things and doing all the wrong things, if you can overcome your own shortcomings, then the same that I've given your other members of that same church, you'll get it too. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. That frightens me. That frightens me, that statement. I will not blot out. Wait a minute. I thought we understood that everyone's saved. So why would he even say, I will not blot out his name? What is going on there? For me, that's a mystery. Because my understanding is, all believers are saved. So what does he mean by, I will not blot out his name out of the book of life? You know what? I'll leave it to you to decide. Do some research if you have to. He that hath an ear to ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Once again, there's a summary. But what's the meaning of Sardis? It means this that which remains. Or that which is escaping. It has a double-sided meaning to it. He commends their works once again. He rebukes them because their spirit, their life is simply dead. They are dead to the workings of the spirit of the Most High. They're just dead. It's like they're functioning in the kingdom. Just functioning, but not really feeling not really opening to the spirit of the Most High and working with the will of the Most High. They're working under their own violation, not that of the Most High, because they are spiritually dead. And he mentions it. He, he, he pleads to them, exhortation, be watchful, strengthen the things that remain. Hear the word remain? Meaning of Sardis, that which remains. There's a link every single time. Alternative, you will come as a thief and do things that you would think to yourself, nah, God, why? But we know why. Each individually, we all know our own shortcomings of what's going on in our own lives. We're not perfect. But it's a continuation. Sorry. We must continue to maintain reflectful of the things that we say and do and think. Everything about us. Because we acknowledge we're living in the last days. So as a result, these are the times that we truly need to shape up. 
if we are going to get the reward which we believe we deserve, if we believe we deserve certain rewards, then do our actions match the reward in which you intend to receive? If it doesn't, let's shape up. Next verse. Number seven. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write, these things said he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee, because thou hast kept the word of my patience. And I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world. To try them that dwell upon the earth. Temptation. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. And he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God. And the name of the city of my God, which is a new Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. What's the meaning? Let's look at the summary once again. The meaning of Philadelphia. Is brotherly love, people. Brotherly love. Look what you can obtain by demonstrating brotherly love. In the truest form. Remove thyself, fish ends and needs. And work and walk and talk and act in the will of the Most High. Treat your brethren like how you want to be treated. If you want respect, be respectful. If you want love, be loving. If you want peace, be peaceful. And so on and so forth. Let's walk in the spirit, in the trueness of the spirit of the living God. The fruit thereof. And he commends them. And if you realize... There is no rebuke. We now have a second example. A second example on how a church, body, kingdom, an aspect of the body of the most high God is perfect in the eyes of the Almighty. And if they can do it, so can we. So can us. I don't, I don't know which way is the right way around, but anyway. Yes? If they can do it, so, not, let's make it personal, so can I. It's a choice. Either we, we connect to the spirit of the living God that's within us, that connects to our individual spirit. You remember that about the soul, what it means. By connecting with that, with sincerity, with wholeness, with integrity, with deliberate action to say, I want to serve my God in the way that he desires us to be. Because what? I, we, us are made in the image and the likeness of the Most High. And here we have two examples now of the type of likeness 
that the Most High desires us to be. Hallelujah. Why? Excuse me. Number 14 of Revelation 3. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodosians, write, these things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither what? Cold nor hot. I would thou work cold or hot. Excuse me. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Half in, half out. Because thou sayest, in number 17, but thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, meaning the life fire. That thou mayest be rich and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see as many as I love. I say it again, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and what? Repent. Lord God, repent once again. And I'm going to say it again. How many times, how many of us, this includes myself, that the moment I get baptized by water, Holy Spirit, and I repent, in that moment, does it ever happen again? For most of us, the answer is no. Let's be honest. For most of us, it is a resounding no. Which means, when we talk about renewing and growing, are we truly renewing? Are we truly growing? Can't be the case. Because if we were renewing, we would understand the need to repent. Why? Because we are connected with the Spirit of the Most High God who reveals these things to us. Individually and even corporately as a church. We need to shape up. Behold, number 20. I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door. If any man hear my voice and open the door. I will come into him and I will sup with him. And he with me. That is a blessing beyond measure. An absolute blessing beyond measure. To him that overcometh, will I grant to sit with me in my throne. Even as I also overcame, I am set down with my father in his throne. He that hath a hear, let him hear. And let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches once again. Look at, look at the summary again. Laodicea. Meaning is justice. Judgment. You see what I think? When I look upon the names and meanings of all those churches, those seven churches, <laughs> well, I, I guess I'm just thinking this out loud. Okay, My opinion. 
the Most High is displaying his character to us. The Most High is displaying his character to us. His divine, holy character in the names of those seven churches. Seven has a meaning of wholeness, of completeness. Seven is important. Why those seven? Why those names? It hasn't revealed it. This is my firm belief. The Most High is displaying to us His divine character. And because we are made in the image and the likeness of, of the Most High, therefore it is my character. It is our character. We can choose to behave and walk with power and might and authority in that even when we are going through serious tribulations as we saw described by those two churches. They went through some serious tribulations but their reward, their reward, my word, their reward. They were perfect in the sight of the Most High. Once again, if they can do it, then so can we. So can I. On the next slide, it gives you a whole of the summary of Revelation 2 and 3. If you, if you do grab a copy of the paper, you will see at the very back of the paper is that same copy for your reference. So all of this is in relation to ensuring that the will of the Most High is indeed attained through us. And as a result of that, to ensure that we are acting in the will of the Most High, it means being in one accord with the Most High. From closing down, being in one accord in the Most High. In the, in the New, King's, New, New King James Study Bible, in the New King James Study Bible, for the next slide, the meaning of one accord, it expounds the meaning to be this. The New King James Bible, Study Bible. This phrase is made of two words that mean same and mind. The phrase speaks of people sharing the same mind or thinking like-mindedly. It does not refer to people who, who all think and feel the same way, because we don't about everything, but to people who set aside what? Personal feelings and commit themselves to one task. Being in one accord. Can we accept that those two churches that gave us a prime example were acting in one accord with the Most High. The members were acting in one accord with the Most High. Right? I also look for the same meaning in our Bible known as the New Spirit Field Study Bible. The New Spirit Field Study Bible. And it says this, unanimity. The disciples had an intellectual unanimity, an emotional rapport, a brethren, sistren, and volitional agreement in the newly found church. In each of its occurrences, the phrase shows a harmony leading to action. In one accord. So even though there are differences amongst each other, because it's individuals, that's fine. But acting in the best interest of the kingdom is paramount. If all of our emotions, if all of our thinking can be like-minded in one accord with the Most High, then we will be the example of those two churches. Because there's no room for division. There's no room for contest. We already saw that even the disciples themselves went through contest amongst themselves. So I'm sure that when the Most High revealed this to Johnny and the islander of Patmos, he was speaking to everyone in the kingdom. 
those disciples who were still alive and those who were not. And therefore, us too. So last but not least, in completion, my summary is this, in regards to one accord. All believers need to be in agreement with all other believers concerning the gospel of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, the Anointed One. And work together to accomplish his will and not place our own will before his. May the Lord bless you. In the name of Yeshua we pray. Hallelujah. Daddy, may I ask you to pray please. I feel that, I feel that this message requires it to be ended by you, our bishop, in prayer. Please. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. To God be the glory. Great things. You have done so long in the world. You give us this son, this bless your son, and pray the word to us today. Thank you, Lord. May God give us strength and encourage you, Lord. So, in the word, whatever, whatever things the word is done, if we can preach the word to somebody, as we got to preach the word to ourselves. Let's listen to the word. As we listen to the word today, let's bow our heads for a moment in time. Let's be quiet for just a little while. that Jesus was speaking to John on the Isle of Patmos concerning the church. Give him the revelation of what he was all about as the one who is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. The one that who said, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. As you're standing in the presence of the Lord and as you would to commend yourselves and judge yourself according to the word. Lord, am I truly obedient to your word? Am I truly serving you as I want to serve you? the world. 
word has gone forth, I pray God that the word will not enter into our ears and out of our ears, but that the word will enter into our hearts. By receiving the word of God, we shall receive faith. We believe that all things are possible, and that there is nothing impossible with Him. As we come, Lord Jesus, because you have given us power over all the powers of the enemy. Whatsoever we bind on earth is bound in heaven. And whatsoever we lose on earth is loosed in heaven. This afternoon, as we come in the name of Jesus, we bind every plan of the enemy, every plan of the devil that is coming against the body of Christ. The church. We bind and repel in the name of Jesus. We repel in the name of Jesus. And we declare that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And we have this treasure in earth and fencing. My God, I pray right now by the power of the Holy Spirit and the anointing of the Holy Spirit, Lord, that you would touch everyone. My God, right now, from the crown of their head, from the sole of their feet, and from shoulder to shoulder, I pray, God, that you would bind us together with the cords of love. We come against the power of darkness that will come to bring division. But in the name of Jesus Christ, we are standing even eyes upon the rock.
Glory to God. And now may the saving grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, full fellowship of the Holy Spirit, divine comforter, rest, remain, and abide with us now and forevermore. Amen. God bless you and stay blessed.